Good afternoon and welcome. Miigwech, thank you for joining uh, the Saugan Ojibwe Nation Bruce Power Medical Isotopes Community Information Session. Ani Bojo and Nkwe and Dishnaka as Ogakan and Don Jaba, Mishika and Dodam. My name is Kathleen Ryan. I'm the Acting Manager of the Saugan Ojibwe Nation Environment Office and I'll be hosting the session today. So today, like I said, we're having a meeting about the SON Bruce Power Medical Isotopes partnership. And we're following up from community sessions that we had in 2019, which is when we first introduced uh, the SON communities, Saugeen and Nawash, to the Medical Isotopes Partnership. So we're here today to share some updates and some more information and to bring community along on this journey as we develop this partnership with Bruce Power. Uh, since our original community session, we worked with members of both Nawash and Saugeen, community language speakers and an artist to develop um, a name in Anishinaabemowin and a logo. And I think uh, those of you participating will see those later during a presentation. But I just wanted to kind of highlight that and the name that was developed um, with language speaker uh, Polly Kishik Tobias at Nawash was Gamzoka Mena Kozawin which means we are teaming up to fight the sickness. And the logo that you'll see was developed by Saugeen First Nation artist, Emily Kiwigishig. So miigwech to the community members who um, worked to develop um, the logo and the name for this partnership. I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge uh, those members. Uh, so today we have a panel of leadership, both from Saugeen Ojibwe Nation and from Bruce Power. We also have medical expert, Dr. Rebecca Wong here um, to discuss both the San Bruce Power partnership and the production and application of medical isotopes. So we'll be discussing today the partnership and medical isotopes in three segments. The first will be sort of broadly about the San Bruce Power partnership. The second part will be around economic benefits of the partnership. And the last segment will be around production and uses of medical isotopes. And before we begin, I just wanna point um, participants to some functions on your screen. So at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the Q&A function. This is where at any point during the presentation, you can ask a question. Um, so any point you can ask a question, we'll just try to sort of organize the questions into those three different categories I said uh, earlier. So if your question doesn't get answered right away, we will make sure to get to it. There may also be interactive polls that appear on your screen and ask you questions. So you can just click and answer the question and participate in those. Um, I also wanna let uh, everybody everyone participating know that we will be recording this session and we will post it to the Environment Office webpage later this week, along with sort of a paper copy of any of the questions and answers um, that are given today. So if you uh, watch the session today and you'd like to uh, pass on the information uh, to a friend or another community member, we will be sharing the video so others can watch. So without any further ado, I will pass things over to the panelists to introduce themselves. We have Chief Lester Anaquat, Chief Greg Najuan, Mike Renchek, James Skoniak, and Dr. Rebecca Wong. So I'll pass it over maybe uh, to Chief Najuan and uh, to begin sort of introducing yourselves in the session. Miigwech. Hello, Ani, Hogaman Najuan, Greg Najuan, and uh, welcome everyone to the latest update on the isotope initiative. Miigwech. Okay, I guess Ani Bajo, Ogamanakut Dijnikas, Sagin Donjaba. I I too would like to welcome everyone to the uh, traditional territory of Sagin Ojibwe. It's a historical moment to have a uh, partnership such as this with Bruce Power, and uh, I look forward to the conversation we're going to have this afternoon. Hopefully, we can answer any of the questions and uh, um, do our best to give our medical <laughs> take on the issue. I do know that the advancements in the the isotope is uh, is quite quite extreme to the fact that uh, it can uh, it can uh, address cancer that's already metastasized. So that, that in itself is a big advancement. 
without invasive surgery. So that, that to me really, really rings home and uh, I am looking forward to our discussion. Miigwech. Good afternoon, I'm Mike Rinchek, President and CEO of Bruce Power. I'd like to acknowledge that the session today, although we're doing it virtually, is taking place on a traditional and territory uh, of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. And again, thanks for welcoming us into your, into your community and hearing us today. Uh, it's a really positive, positive effort that we have ongoing that we'll be able to affect so many people really throughout our area, throughout Canada, but throughout the world and really deliver life-saving uh, hope for people that are uh, really fighting the disease and having a hard time with it. So with this, uh, with this partnership that we have, uh, we just think there's so many positive things we can do in the world. It's just exciting to be part of it. James? Great. Th uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today. My name is James Skoniak. Uh, and uh, um, one of the areas of responsibility I have at Bruce Power is our medical isotope business. I work for, for Mike Renchuk, as does everybody at Bruce Power. Um, we have just a fantastic team in our, our, our medical isotope group that uh, is, is very passionate about this, uh, this opportunity, um, really because of the difference it can make. And I think what's even more exciting about this is, is the fact that we've been able to do something fresh and new and exciting between uh, Bruce Power uh, and the Son community. Because as Mike noted, uh, we, we do operate in the traditional territories of, of, of the Son. And, and I'm really looking forward to today's discussion and the many things we can do together, both in the community and across the world. So thanks for having me. Hi, um, I'm Rebecca Wong. I'm a radiation oncologist at Princess Margaret Cancer Center. Um, I've been involved in the theranostic space, which we'll talk about some more um, uh, for about seven years. Um, and um, it complements external beam radiotherapy, which is uh, um, what we do predominantly. But this is a very exciting space that I think will open a lot of doors uh, in terms of uh, fighting cancer. Um, I'm the principal investigator for the Ontario trial. Um, I am have always been very impressed uh, since uh, getting into this field, understanding the vision of Bruce Power and being able to be here to um, uh, collaborate um, and um, uh, build collaboration across Canada and, and globally. Thanks. Uh, thanks for those introductions, everyone. Before we get into some of the discussion topics, uh, we're just going to show uh, a short video that talks a little bit about the SON Bruce Power Partnership and medical isotopes. In the community, we talk about walking that good path. So in Kikana. And when you walk that path, you're actually leaving footprints for others to follow. This path has been formed by the community members of SON and Bruce Power, and it drives the work we do today, as well as provides a path for those who will come after. If we don't step up, no one else will. It's our responsibility as Canadians to do that, and that's why. Yep, it looks like we're having so a little- world leader in the production of isotopes. They are used as a key tool in the fight against cancer, helping patients all over the world. Isotopes have extra neutrons, which can make them unstable, causing them to give off energy. The radioactive lutetium-177 binds to a molecule that attaches itself to the disease cells to destroy them. And that's how we fight cancer. A nuclear reactor, for all intensive purposes, it's really a large neutron source. We put cobalt-59 in the reactor, it picks up a neutron, and at the end of it, we have cobalt-60. So from the perspective of lutetium, we thought, well, can we duplicate this to make other isotopes? And the answer is yes. So look at it as we're leveraging an existing asset to build a, a really large redundant supply of isotopes. If we can successfully deploy this delivery system that we're partnering with SON on to make lutetium-177, who's to say we can't make other isotopes? It's uh, very exciting times. I am looking forward to this partnership. It certainly is a path forward that Bruce Power and Saugeen Ojibwe may have never experienced up until now. 
in terms of a private sector company coming together with an indigenous community whose facility is in their traditional territory to not only develop a successful business venture but something of international significance. Both Bruce Power and Saugeen Ojibwe Nation have been looking for a way that we could partner on something and it's not just about economics and also just about reconciliation because now we have an opportunity to actually be involved in something positive. With our partnership today, we'll be able to supply enough Lutetium-177 that the medical community will be able to formalize this as a normal treatment for prostate cancer. As people uh, around the world, not just here in Ontario, as people around the world need isotopes for diagnosis or treatment, they need to know there's a reliable supply. Just, just imagine, you know, multiple private sector companies working with an Indigenous community to partner to put this critical national infrastructure in place. This is of national and international significance. This is groundbreaking. I'm muted. A um, little bit of a technical difficulty at the beginning there, but there was the video about the partnership. I just put something out in the chat for um, anyone attending that there is a website, www.fightingcancertogether.ca. Um, and that website is about the partnership. So if you did want to watch that video or share it with anyone else, it is contained in that website. If you just look in the chat, the address is there. Okay, so now I think we're going to start the first uh, segment of our discussion, and this is the discussion on the Son Bruce Power Partnership. So just talking a little bit about what that partnership is and how it works. So we have basically three questions that we'll put to the, the panelists. So this one is um, mainly the Chiefs and Mike and James. So the first question is, what is the structure of the partnership between Saugeen Ojibwe Nation and Bruce Power? I don't know who wants to kick this one off. Maybe. I, I can start if that's okay. I'll just say I, I think the partnership is really an outcome of the, of the work that we've been doing together in interactions around employment, business development, uh, community support projects, and also some of the work that the environmental teams uh, are doing. Uh, further advanced like the coastal water study. I think it, it's just an outcome of those relationships that have built through that time to be able to, to take uh, the isotope uh, work that we're doing and advance it to the next level. When you, when you look at the isotopes, as we, we talked earlier, it's really something positive that we can do together uh, and fighting cancer. And, and when you look at that disease, it, it doesn't have a boundary. It doesn't, uh, whether you're sitting here in, in Canada or you're sitting somewhere else around the world, it, it knows no limitations. I think this is a positive thing that, that we can do together. And at the same time, by doing it together, we can create those opportunities that are not just economic, but really start to bridge relationships even deeper and further into the future. The economic pieces are, are as important uh, for the community. And I think uh, structure therein, like I said, we're just getting started. So being at the ground stage of this really enables it to evolve over many, many years to come as well as we, as we perfect this production system that we'll install this year. It'll provide opportunities for continued investment and continuous business business opportunities. Chiefs, did any of you, either of you have anything to add kind of about, maybe just overall about the kind of partnership between Son and Bruce Power? Maybe some of the context for it. I think that's what Mike just also shared. So maybe something Chiefs. I'll start. The, uh... It's been a, a relationship that's grown over the years. I mean, we certainly, uh, where we're at today, took a great deal of time and effort to get us to this place today with a partnership with Bruce Power. 
Uh, not to go delve into the past as much as the exclusion, uh, the legacy of exclusion, I suppose, back in the early stages of development with the facility. But uh, with that in mind, uh, we're at a place now where we're, we're, we're um, collaborating at the same table, having those discussions around partnerships going forward. And uh, not only that, it's a, an, an economic benefit to, 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 to both the community and uh, the, broader, the broader global economy or, or community, if you will. As uh, Mike had mentioned, uh, cancer doesn't discriminate. So for us, it's a win-win. So. And the relationship that we have today, I, I believe it, 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 it falls on the back of a lot of past employees, uh, people that have come and gone through the Stone Environment Office as well, uh, former councillors as well as chiefs. I mean, it's, it's, it's taken a lot, to, uh, a lot of work to get where we are today. And I'm quite pleased with the fact that we do have a, a good positive working relationship. And uh, I think that's demonstrated by this partnership as well as others that we do have as in, in the area. So with that, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to this, this project going forward and uh, definitely very supportive of it with that. Miigwech. Chief Nanjawan, is there anything you wanted to add about the partnership or the structure of the partnership? Well, <clears throat> I would just be reiterating what's already been uh, been said, but uh, if you're going to get involved in, in an initiative that's going to go on in the uh, coming decades, uh, these plants are, are the uh, reactors are going to be refurbished uh, as part of the uh, province's long-term energy plan for another four decades, and so it's. Uh, four decades of opportunity that could go even beyond that. Okay. James, is there anything that you want to say just on that first kind of question I ask about, asked about the structure of the partnership or contextually anything you wanted to kind of begin with? I think everybody uh, covered all the key points. The only, the only items I would underscore is, is, you know, let, let's call a spade a spade, I think. And, 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 when, when Mike uh, really challenged us all around a, a new relationship and with the Chiefs uh, a number of years ago, collectively, we want the next 50 years to look different than the last 50 years. And uh, that, that we're going to have to do work together on a lot of fronts, many fronts, um, to achieve that. That's not going to happen overnight. But this is one area in addition to others that we decided to focus on together because it's a it's a new opportunity it's something that is fresh and so with that not only is going to be a product that that obviously is very important for uh, fighting cancer around the world but with that product is going to come some economic uh, activity and really what this has been about is about saying uh, how, how do we ensure uh, the communities of Sogin and Naywash and collectively the San uh, can share in that economic benefit. And more importantly, we see the government of Canada investing in areas like this in terms of new technology. And so this also provides an opportunity for us to collectively encourage the government of Canada to direct some of those investment dollars in a, in a project like this. Either way, there will be a financial benefit to the Song community, but if we can work together to encourage that government funding uh, come to the project, what it does is it further increases the, the financial benefit to the community. So yes, it's a great thing to do, but at the end of the day, as the chiefs always remind us, they have an obligation to make sure they are bringing in revenues to meet a range of community needs that are growing. And so, yes, it's, it's, it's great that we are doing things to help people, but we're also doing some, some things here to generate a revenue source to the community um, and through this partnership that will meet the, the needs that the community decides are, are, are important to Great, James. So maybe kind of on that note, what you've just kind of been talking about government funding and backing up or I don't know, talking a little bit more about that partnership structure and in terms of, you know, why that government funding piece is important and how the partnership would work and sort of just explaining a little bit more about 
what that means in terms of the partnership. And then we can talk a little bit more about where that funding would go and what that means in terms of uh, community benefit. No, it's, a, it's a good question. So I think I think it's important to start off with that with a couple of principles. The first thing is is there there is uh, through this partnership there is is uh, there is no SON community money being invested uh, into the project. Um, uh, recognize that that was not uh, that that was not an option that was. Uh, um, uh, that, that, that was available to the Community, nor is there any financial risk on the part of the Community related to this. So, and those were two very important elements that the, the Chiefs uh, and Council uh, articulated earlier. So look at this, look at this partnership as one that can, can really has two opportunities to it. What we've done is without government funding, we've enabled uh, uh, what we call in an earn-in type period, where it basically means that on the project, Bruce Power is, is, is crediting SON for what we call a virtual loan. And then as the project generates money, which we expect at peak by about 2025, in terms of the item with SON, we'll generate about $2 million a year in revenue. A million dollars a year for 20 years will go to um, uh, re repaying that virtual loan, so to speak. Uh, uh, and the other million dollars will go to the community. That's path number one. Path number two, is is around government funding whereas if we get government funding then there is no virtual loan uh to repay in which a hundred percent of that that revenue can go into the community so the the opportunity here kathleen for government revenue is um is really important obviously the project has to perform it has to work with this is a business so there are sometimes things go better than plan and there's sometimes things go worse than plan financially um, so, you know, there's no guarantee the revenues are at that stage, but there is a guarantee that there's no negative risk to SON if we, if we run into business items. I can tell you my boss, Mike Renchek, um, <laughs> he, uh, he is holding me to ex far exceed the plan and we're confident we can, uh, we can do that. So we're very confident we'll be providing that full return. But look, I don't want to, the government of Canada has been great to deal with and we've all worked together with them. But this is a really important touch for the government of Canada. They have put a lot of funding into areas around Indigenous uh, reconciliation, economic development. This is a project that, that is there. It's, it's ready for funding. And if the funding comes, 100% of the benefit of it goes to the SON. And we're really, we really hope they will, they will step up on that front. Yeah, James, and I, I share that. I think you know, when you look at projects that are undertaken, uh, this one has so many meaningful outcomes in terms of positioning Canada uh, as a world leader in the area of medical treatments and treating cancer and isotope production. And it, it's just such a great place to start uh, with our with our community. So I, that's all I would add on to this. And I, I think I, I hope they see their way to be able to fund this. I think the benefits uh, to the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation community, as well as the benefits to the people of Canada are probably unique in that one project like this will help so many. Thank you. Um, just to build on to that conversation, just so, so members, those listening, have a, a really good idea about this partnership and how it's structured. So I just wanted to go back to some of the things you were talking about, James. So regardless, you talked about two different paths, one being a, an earn an earning structure, the other one being the government funding structure. Um, where does the funding go? So we talk about it's going to fund the medical isotopes project, but what does that mean? Where does this funding actually go that SON would contribute or would be SON's contribution and then SON would be earning? So what happens with that funding? And what does it support? So in, you know, if, you, if you look at this from, from the perspective of, of sort of any business that is out there in the community, there's a certain amount of investment that has to go in between Bruce Power and our partners in the project Isogen uh, to develop this delivery system that will be producing these isotopes. It's a fairly substantial investment. So um, any government dollars received will go to cover the capital cost uh, of that and then effectively what we would do is instead of paying a bank interest we will provide a, a, a return to, um, to to the community on an ongoing basis so look at it like it's no different than putting money in the bank 
um, you're, you're, you're going to be, uh, you're contributing to that and we will pay a return, so to speak on that over the next, um, over the next 20 years. So it's very, it's very sustainable funding. And of course we want to grow the use of that where there's also provisions to, to Mike's broader challenge and that, that provides a, a additional uh, community benefit. Yeah, and I think, James, you know, the, the concrete things that will go into to this system, we call it a system or a process, but it's made up of stainless steel tubes uh, and, and air, air compressors, as well as it will attach and bolt onto the reactor. So that system of, of tubes and switches and channels are being designed by engineers here in Canada and uh, based on technologies coming out of Germany and that'll be adapted. And then when uh, the analysis is complete for the installation to install here in our reactors, it will go to, it is in fact in process with the CNSE, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission for their review and approval. And once that is uh, received and approved, it will have to be physically installed in our first in our unit seven this fall uh, during its, its outage. And then there's also been a lot of great scientific work that has gone on with actually creating the mechanical pieces that will get irradiated to actually generate the, uh, the isotope. And then how that gets transferred from Bruce Power to companies that will take it and turn it into medicine. So some very practical things that the money goes into to build uh, tangible and physical pro you know, assets that are used to produce the isotope. Great. So the last thing I want to touch on around sort of that area um, or this area around the partnership and some of the community benefit. James, you mentioned some of those numbers around the kind of $2 million um, earnings per year or the estimated $2 million earnings per year. Um, I wanted to point out just, or you can talk about this maybe a little bit, but how Saugin Ojibwe Nation as a partner in terms of benefiting from this project has really been prioritized as we built the partnership. Um, so James, maybe you could just talk a little bit more just about the earning structure um, and how, or I'm just going to say it maybe because I can't ask a question about it. Um, just how kind of son is the first earner. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's a really important component. So like any business, you have uh, costs that go in and expenses that come out. And, and until those are all paid, you don't earn a, a profit. So what we've agreed in this partnership is that, that uh, um, once we're at scale, and it's going to take us a few years to get up to that scale. So it's not going to be overnight, but we see it within the next uh, three to four years. One, once we're at scale uh, and, and we are making profit, as a partner in this, that two million, that up to two million dollars that Song can earn, those are the first profits that are distributed from this. So, so Son is, um, you know, we we prioritize that Son involvement before our own uh, uh, profitability of in the project. And I, you know, I think that was really important, right? That was an important uh, uh, area of of trust between the two parties and. And look, our hope is over, over many years, as Mike mentioned, that we are doing other isotopes from this delivery system and there's extra revenue stream in that. So, you know, similar to other revenue stream that Indigenous communities have or SON has in particular, we hope this is going to be a very reliable, steady revenue stream. So the chiefs and the council and the community, you can make your own decisions about where to invest those dollars. But, you know, we've taken a very imprudent approach here. Success for us in this project is not just a successful delivery system that's producing isotopes. Success for us in this project is seeing the, the maximum uh, financial return possible from this project to the SON because we recognize we're making up for, for lost ground over the last 50 years. And this is a great new way to do this. So um, I, I think we're very aligned on this, Kathleen. And I think um, it's, it's been a very collaborative relationship to get to this stage. And I think it's gonna continue to build more trust and more opportunity as we move forward. Yeah, we holistically believe in this as well. I mean, it, it's just fundamentally the right thing for us to do collectively. And we believe in the system. We believe in the treatments that'll be coming, be coming from this. Uh, we think that benefit, again, will go far and wide. And uh, it's something that we'll pursue vigorously, not only with the first system, but on others well into the future. Great. 
So the last question uh, that I have here around the partnership, and this is a question that we get often. Um, I've gotten this question a lot more often from government officials than I have from community members. But one of the question is, um, will there be employment opportunities as part of this partnership? Um, so maybe James can take that. Um, but I know we've heard that a lot. The answer is absolutely. Um, so I think there's two elements to this partnership to look at. I think Chief Najuan and Mike covered this in their opening remarks. So number one, all of the items related to the Bruce Power operation are obviously important to the success of this delivery system. So we want to continue to work together to increase employment in all of those areas. One of the things I think we're going to be able to do here is create, and Mike's been challenging me on this, so maybe Mike's the better person to take the, the other part of this. You know, we believe once we have this delivery system, it's going to create an ecosystem here in Ontario and here in this region around isotope processing. Why would you not process and do more of this isotope work in our own backyard than send it over to Germany or somewhere else? We're going to still send materials overseas, but to do more. So, you know, this is going to be a tremendous opportunity for, for the community, a great opportunity for young people to, to, to look at getting in the medical field. And so it's really tough to quantify exactly Kathleen, but it's only uh, tough to quantify because it could be so significant. Mm -hmm. Okay, So we do have a question that has come in on the chat from a community member. So I'm just going to read the question. Um, I, uh, I think the prospects for the partnership are really good, um, but I didn't hear an answer as to the nature of the business arrangement. Is it a legal business partnership? Has a uh, corporation been created? And who directs the partnership? Who represents SON on the partnership? So that's a, that's a, a, a four-part question, um, but maybe we can break it off into chunks there. Um, Sorry, just disappeared for me. So the, the first part, is it a legal business partnership? Yeah, so sorry, I could have done a better job answering that. So so uh, the, the partnership is directly between the Saugino Ojibwe Nation and Bruce Power Inc. So it's a, it's a, it's a formal binding um, commitment. We're doing some, um, we're, we're finalizing some additional legal documentation in the coming weeks, but yes, it's a formal business partnership between the two parties. Um, and commits Bruce Power to uh, uh, everything that we are uh, discussing here today. Um, I believe, Kathleen, one of the questions had to do with who represents SON. So uh, I know the Chiefs and you will want to speak more to that, but through the business, through this arrangement, we've agreed to a joint steering committee. That steering committee has met a number of times. It does meet regularly. And that steering committee has um, oversight of and view to all of the all the progress on the project, the financials of the, uh, the of the project, and both uh, Sogin and Nawash have appointed counselors uh, who and staff who represent the SON uh, on that, and that's that will be a permanent uh, ongoing uh, 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 oversight piece. Kathleen, I don't know what else I may have missed in there. I, I think you I think you covered the majority of it. So it is a legal business partnership between um, Bruce Power and Saugeen and Nawash collectively as SON. Yep. Um, there's not a new corporation that has been created directing the partnership sort of at the highest level in terms of approvals for Saugeen and Nawash is done at the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation Joint Council table. And then James mentioned we had started a steering committee which includes um, representatives from Bruce Power, uh, representatives from the SON Joint Council table. And we had had some discussions at some of our earlier steering committee meetings about appointing um, a community member, one from each community and doing sort of a process around appointing community members. But I think that last meeting we had was right before COVID. And so that's kind of taken us off track. But I think now that we're sort of getting back into the details on this, that's, um, that's an item that we could pick back up as the steering committee will start meeting again and, and we could um, maybe go through that process. But I think that answers the question. And if it didn't answer the question to the person that answered, please feel free to type in the Q&A box again if you, if you didn't feel that your question was answered. Okay. So um, before we move on, is there anything, um, Mike, uh, Chiefs, that you wanna add on sort of the partnership aspect of things before I kind of move on to some of the more medical and application 
questions to the doctor? So, uh, Chief Bajuan, <clears throat> this uh, initiative has has many spokes to it. The isotope initiative is is the, is the hub. Initially, we're looking at a dividend of a million per community, but that hopefully is going to grow over the years as the pilot grows into a, a, a more uh, uh, bigger business, I guess. And it depends on the uh, supply and demand. If the uh, initial pilot is, is successful as we all hope it to be, and it, it looks like it has uh, legs, to grow bigger. We're only initially talking about uh, taking a byproduct from uh, focusing on, on one reactor. If the supply is there, as years go uh, by, the, uh, the same uh, initiative might uh, be utilized in a second reactor maybe even a third reactor. So uh, the chiefs, the councils, the governance going forward, uh, we'll be looking at bigger uh, buy-ins as, as a partner. So the dividends hopefully will grow over the years and the uh, relationship will become more uh, solid, firmer, trusting. I believe this is what you call putting re reconciliation into action. And uh, I truly see, because so many people are partnered in this, you have the technology aspect of the scientist, the health aspect, <clears throat> the economic uh, dividends. From it. I, I, I think it's got so many great things involved in the mix. Uh, it's also going to make us, uh, myself, I'll speak for myself. I've always said we have this, the potential to take some of the byproducts that are now coming out of uh, the making of electricity and utilizing them in day to day functions. There, I've always said this, that there's some young people now sitting in universities who will become interested in, in, in that field and will start developing uh, more and more products from this initial uh, uh, initiative. I think it has a great future and I, I don't sit here with my fingers crossed. I truly believe that as years go by, we are uh, participating uh, on the ground floor will we'll grow over the years and uh, it will put the oxygen back in the room when we're talking about uh, nuclear uh, power. Much. Much. Okay, so I think we've gone over a lot of the aspects of the partnership, some of the economic parts of the partnership, that there will be an annual return uh, to the San community, Saugeen and Nawash, once isotopes are kind of in, in full production in a few years. Um, the next there was a second session about economic benefits of the partnership, but I think we've basically covered all of the topics that we had listed already. Um, but again, if anybody has any more questions about the partnership, some of the economic parts of it, please feel free to use that Q&A box and we'll still answer any questions if anybody feels like something hasn't been covered. Um, but I think I'm gonna move to segment three, which is around is medical isotopes. So what they are, um, how they'll be produced at Bruce Power and how um, they are used sort of in the medical 
application. So I have a few questions here that maybe I'll pose to, I think mainly uh, Dr. Wong, maybe I know James is also very excitable about this topic and he may want to add some, uh, some things about isotopes in here. Uh, so I'll just ask the question and, um, and whoever sort of wants to answer or build on each other, just go ahead. So, so the first question is about sort of medical isotopes research in general and around how, so where is the research around medical isotopes at? Um, and sort of where do you see the trajectory of, of the application of medical isotopes going forward? So I'll have a go. Um, I did prepare some slides, but I think a dialogue will be uh, better. Um, the, it, it is a very uh, rapidly growing field um, compared with even five or six years ago, um, there's a lot more excitement. And um, partly because of the successes with um, the treatments um, that have been proven using lutetium to treat neuroendocrine tumors and prostate cancer be, being emerging um, uh, field. Um, the, uh, the, the current studies um, are focusing a lot on refining the uh, applications for neuroendocrine tumor and also proving that it works in prostate cancer. Um, the existing evidence um, are very promising that it would uh, improve quality of life, maybe, um, and make people live longer without uh, progressive disease and perhaps long-term survival being improving, um, as well as um, curing the previously incurable. Those are all um, yes. potentially on the horizon. Um, so that's uh, where the activity is. Um, and uh, the other part is using newer isotopes. Uh, Lutetium-177 is the most um, well-studied and applied right now, but there are other newer isotopes that perhaps um, have uh, additional therapeutic ratios that um, are being investigated. Yeah, so right now, um, I guess maybe I should have started with that. It mentioned it in the video, but and we've mentioned it a few times, but we are talking about one particular isotope that is being produced in this par partnership, and that's lutetium-177 that Dr. Wong is mentioning. Um, and that there, and Chief Najwan mentioned this earlier, there's the potential for many other isotopes sort of in the nuclear medicine sort of arena to, to be in demand in the coming years because they have shown um, applicability in a lot of uh, medical treatments. So around lutetium-177, um, this is a question for James, how will Bruce Power produce lutetium-177? How does that work? Well, as Dr. Wong noted, and it was covered in the video, is, is you can make isotopes as complicated or as simple as you would like. In the case of Dr. Wong, she has to understand all the complications because she's using them to either diagnose or treat cancer or in her field of theranostics. She's doing both at the same time, which is really what, what's unique about the TCM. I'm not sure she'll talk about that. So, so think of an isotope as really um, a form of energy that you're using to either diagnose or treat cancer in the case of lutetium. So all we're really doing is we are exposing uh, an element to energy that we have pre-existing in our reactors. Um, it is picking up some of that energy and being turned into a useful form. So um, unfortunately, I left it at the office, but I have a, it's a small target that would really be about uh, this long. And what we will do is we will, um, through this delivery system we talked about, is we will be inserting a certain number, depending on how many, uh, how much lutetium is needed, of these small targets. And they're filled with uh, uh, an element called ytterbium-176. And they go into the reactor and they will pick up some of that energy. And what will come out is a different, um, uh, is, is a different um, material in the case of lutetium-177, and we take that out, it has picked up that extra energy. But actually, because it's picked up that extra energy, it wants to go back to being what it was before. So think about it like you take an ice cube out of your freezer and you have to make sure it doesn't melt before you get it into your, your cup of water. So that, you know, we have about six to seven days to get that ytterbium once it's out of the reactor to 
uh, somebody like Dr. Wong who will use it in a patient. And that's where a lot of the supply chain is really important. But, but Kathleen, in its simplest form, all it is, a, an isotope is really just another form of energy that is used in those medical applications. And, and this delivery system is all about exposing something to pick that energy up. So we take it and Dr. Wong and all those amazing miracle workers at the University Health Network that Dr. Wong works with, that they can do what they do. Yeah. 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 So there's, there's a question in the chat, but I'm just gonna ask one follow-up question just around the production of the isotopes at the site. So as you know, and as people listening from the community will know, um, Nuclear waste is always top of mind for the SON community, for the leadership, um, an issue that we're dealing with on an ongoing basis. So a question has come up a couple of times around medical isotopes is um, how much or what types of nuclear waste does medical isotopes production create? Um, so the, the process itself um, that we will undertake um, because these are what we call short-lived isotopes, which means that it's like, I think of that ice cube that comes out of your freezer and it melts back to its original form. So we, we are not through that process creating nuclear waste. The processing uh, of these isotopes or the, 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 the supply chain that is carried out, it constantly reprocesses these items. So we are not, um, we are not producing uh, in the process itself uh, a form of um, a form of uh, nuclear waste. We will still have the the waste products from our core operation that we will safely manage, uh, fund, uh, and provide to our service provider. But in the in in the production of iso of of these short lived isotopes, we will not be in that process uh, developing a nuclear waste product. Which, um Another question related to sort of any potential uh, negative impacts. So the question was, we've heard about economic benefit and the impact on health. Uh, what is the impact of the production of isotopes on the environment? Maybe Dr. Wong may want to talk about how they handle them in the hospitals and the, 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 the various processes in place and then Mike or I could, I mean, it's basically negligible, but we'd be happy to provide some context at Bruce Power. Um, sure, so um, in terms of the handling of the radioisotope, as uh, James mentioned, it is short, it has a short half-life, um, is precisely uh, almost seven days. Um, so that means that um, when the drug arrives at the hospital, um, by seven days later is half the activity. Um, and uh, actually the, we monitor the patient, we, we infuse the, it's, a, it's an infusion. So it's a, um, uh, in, in an IV that is given to the patient um, and actually we order exactly what dose we want. Um, so pretty much everything goes into the patient um, and the patient excreted, it's urine uh, uh, really, uh, uh, cleared from the body um, by the kidneys. Um, so it comes out in the urine and then within a, 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 a half an hour, an hour, most of it is uh, urinated outside uh, the body. And, and it's, uh, the levels that are disposed of um, is um, within safety. So, so there's lots of guidelines within, uh, within our, uh, the healthcare system and, and protecting uh, our, our, our workers and, and the general public that um, mandates a certain level um, of clearance and also the certain level of activity before the patient can leave the hospital. And usually within four hours or so, the patient can leave the hospital like mm -hmm. most other nuclear medicine scans. Um, and any waste like the tubing of the IV et cetera, they are stored in, in a waste room until the level of activity is low enough before they are disposed of. Um, I just want, do want to comment on the, uh, the, the treatment and the side effects of the patients and in general, um, uh, pa patients tolerate this treatment very well. Um, and uh, sometimes it, it makes the blood count drop um, and sometimes it has an effect on the kidneys and, and uh, those are monitored carefully to make sure that um, patients uh, come up with benefits and, and um, um, rather than um, consequences or side effects of the treatment. So 
Sorry, you got to hear my dog's response to your question there. Um, James, I don't know, did you have something you wanted to add around the environmental sort of impact? No, this, this, is, um, this is a very secure uh, process. We're talking on a weekly basis of a volume that would think, of, think about it as a, uh, a lunch bag, a cooler bag size that you'd be talking about on a weekly basis on average initially, so you're not talking a huge volume. There's transportation. I think the one one important area, and uh, Dr. Wong may want to comment on this, is what is really scary to me about when I look at the medical isotope world is how few opportunities there are to make these isotopes in terms of facilities. So um, there are not many facilities that can, can make lutetium. And so we have a whole pile of patients out there and the growth of lutetium is, is increasing as Chief Najwan mentioned, there is not the supply. And so not only is this a great thing for us to be involved in together, but you know, quite seriously, if we are not successful at doing this together, there are a lot of patients who would never have access to lutetium. If they were diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer or a neuroendocrine tumor, or there's other advanced, uh, promising treatments around lutetium that use lutetium, there's, there's not the supply. So, you know, this is, um, sometimes we all, we get caught up in a lot of these details, but we got to also keep that in mind that we're doing something here that isn't only unique for our community, it's going to be viewed around the world as a game changer. Yeah, just to follow up on that, um, we have been running our trial here in Ontario since 2016. Um, and we ran a trial as a way of making this treatment available to patients uh, with neuroendocrine tumors. It's a rare cancer um, and uh, before, and, and there are very tr few treatment options. And before we started our trial, either patients have to fly to Europe to, to have it or go without. Um, even when we open the trial, um, uh, as uh, James said, there's no uh, local supplier, so we actually have to fly the dose of lutetium into uh, Toronto um, and, and ship it to uh, Hamilton to have it um, processed into a drug and uh, driven to the four hospitals that will deliver this treatment. So every week this happens. Um, and there are times when um, the, the dose is stuck at an airport. Um, so we have to cancel the whole thing, um, which uh, especially when patients travel four hours to come for a treatment, it is a big deal. Um, so, um, uh, and, and then on, in addition to that, uh, with these trials, um, being showing that it is efficacious, we really anticipate a, a lot more demand. Uh, neuroendocrine tumor is a rare cancer, but prostate cancer is a, is a common cancer. Um, and there are many different ways that we could use it, and we anticipate that the demand of it will, will be quite significant. Um, and flying it in every dose is, is really not a long-term solution. Mm. Yeah, thanks for bringing up that. That's a really important, um, a really important piece. I think how just how important sort of the local localized production and somewhere local, regionally significant like Southern Ontario, how how important that is sort of overall for the use of nuclear medicine in important sort of treatments like this. Um, there's a question kind of related to what you're talking about now that came in through the chat from a community member, and they're asking. Um, where or who else currently produces medical isotopes? James, you want to answer that? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. Or Mike, Mike, you've got a very good kind of global perspective on this because Mike, Mike used to be in this business also in another world. I don't know, Mike. Yeah, sure, James. I, I can talk about that. James, uh, James is being humble here. He is leading an organization called the uh, uh, Canadian Nuclear Isotope Council. And it really consists of many organizations that either make up, make isotopes or use isotopes. Where isotopes typically come from is historically, they've come out of the university research reactors, which if I had to put it on uh, in terms of the scale that we're able to make isotopes, it would be uh, maybe like my pinky finger, right? Compared to the largest tree you've ever seen, right? <laughs> uh, so we can make the isotopes at a scale that really the medical community has never had 
the ability to harness. And it's really, it's really kept uh, cancer research and cancer treatment pr probably behind where it could have advanced to. And what, it, what I mean by that is if you're a cancer researcher and, and you know it's going to take millions of dollars to uh, invest in an isotope to be able to, to see if it is a successful treatment. And when you look at the ability to actually make the isotope so that it could be affordable for, for many people instead of just a few, you're very hard pressed to find those, those resources out there that can make, make that isotope. With, with this new system that we're investing in, and working on, uh, we'll be able to solve that piece of the equation. In other words, whatever isotopes that we choose together to make, because it's the right thing to do for society, we'll be able to make it at such a scale that it will be affordable to the people of the world so that people can actually use it to be treated. It's like the COBOL-60 we make it here at site. We make COBOL-60, which is another isotope, and it's used to sterilize 40% of the once-use medical devices around the world. That means if you go to the doctor's or dentist's office in Australia, in Germany, uh, in China, or here in Canada, there's a 40% chance that that equipment used uh, was sterilized by an isotope we make right here in Tiverton. And then with the high specific activity COBOL-60, we're powering a device called the Gamma Knife, which is used to treat uh, brain tumors. And, and now we're progressing that into breast cancers. You know, my sister-in-law's example uh, had a, has a brain tumor. Uh, she had it operated on. One of the treatments that was put in front of her was the Gamma Knife, uh, non-intrusive method of treatment. But I think we're unlocking the real potential of the medical community because now they know if we can make it, we can make it at a scale which warrants their their interest in the isotope and, and further investment. And I, you know, I just think we're stepping into a whole nother place with the production capacity. Now they it can be also be made at devices called cyclotrons, but again, it's very very small amounts, uh, very energy intensive, and small amounts. Uh, similar to the research reactors. So this is where Bruce Power and the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation will step in to make a real difference in the world uh, with this scale. And it's really unprecedented worldwide. Uh, over the years, we've looked at this and businesses that I've run to be able to, to do it uh, differently. And it's just a very difficult, uh, difficult equation or I should, difficult problem to solve with, with scale. And we've been able to solve that here at Bruce Power. And like I said, I think this is just the beginning. It's the start of something uh, something much larger and much different than what, what we're used to. Congrats. Thank you. That was a, that was a great answer. Um, I, have, I have one more just on my list here, kind of a medical related question. So maybe Dr. Wangi could take this one. Um, we've gotten this question a few times at um, different community sessions and when I've talked to different people. So does this treatment cost anything and who is eligible for these types of treatments and how is that kind of determined? Um, the, the, the process of getting, I, I, I should start by saying that the, the process that uh, Ontario and, and most across Canada approaches um, approving drug for funding um, is an evidence-based driven one. Um, by that, I mean that the community, us, have to generate the evidence to prove that it has value and benefit to patients at a certain level. Um, and uh, that certain level usually meant randomized trials. Um, so when there is that evidence, then the, uh, the government will look at um, the evidence and say, yes, it's good enough. And when it says, yes, it's good enough, then there's this organization called PCODA, then we'll make a judgment whether it is cost effective. And when they say, yes, it is cost effective, then the provinces will fund it. Um, 
Uh, so by describing that, you can hear that we need to do these big studies to prove that it is effective. Once it is effective, then uh, the, the healthcare system will respond. Um, so at the moment, um, it, these things are expensive, especially uh, just listening to how they are being produced, how they are manufactured uh, per dose. Um, so it's upwards of um, like $40,000 a dose. Um, and I, I'm hoping that as the need and the tech and the um, infrastructure that is uh, required to to generate it, build it, um, is more cost efficient, that price could come down. But at the moment, that's that's kind of the, the pricing of these drugs. So the government is quite careful with uh, um, approving who can access it. Um, so for example, um, uh, using PSMA for prostate cancer patients. Um, so there, uh, the province says, yes, we can use it, but it is under a cancer registry. So uh, as long as the, um, the patient fulfills certain criteria, then they are approved to have the scan. If they don't fulfill those criteria, they are not. Um, similarly, for using lutetium for neuroendocrine patients um, is approved for mid-gut cancer, for example, and um, but not for others. So as the evidence in, uh, mature and emerge, uh, those indications is expected to expand. Kathleen, can I just add just one point uh, to Dr. Yeah. Wong's comments, and Mike mentioned this as well, but one of the things we're doing here that, that I think is a game changer is, I mean, we're really fortunate here in Canada to have a, a, a health system where if you're eligible to have an approved treatment, there's not a financial decision that is made for the patient. There's a lot of areas in the world that is not the, not the case. So, you know, what drives the price of something up? It's the supply versus the demand. We all know that. Being able to produce uh, larger redundant volumes, of these isotopes is, is going to make them more readily available, which will, you know, we hope, you know, we're not a pharmaceutical company, we're providing a raw product. But right now you, you, you have a real supply issue with this isotope. So being able to provide it doesn't only ensure its accessibility to more people, but it, it should also drive the affordability of it for those jurisdictions around the world. So, uh, you know, I think, I think that's really important to know because if you have tight supply, there's number one, only going to be a few people that, that, that are, have access. It may not just be lutetium. It could be other isotopes. So fewer people will receive it. And when you have short supply and high demand, who gets it? Well, the people that can pay the, 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 the per volume cost of that. So I also think there's a good economic argument around making this more readily available around. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's an important conversation around this, just understanding how that system even works in the healthcare uh, area and how these sorts of new treatments come in, you know, and how they get sort of part of the, the standard medical practice. Thank you for that. Um, so I'm cutting us pretty close on time here. So now we do have some time if anybody else who's listening has any additional questions. Um, I'll just put that out there for the next couple of minutes um, if there are any questions that roll in. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to just kind of look to uh, close up this meeting. So I'll just say, um, miigwech, thank you everybody who participated today. Um, like I said, we are going to post this recording. Um, this recording to the Environment Office Facebook page and the website, and we'll share with Sagin and Nawash so that you can access or share with others. Um, we are, of course, going to continue to share information about this partnership with the communities. So you can look to our, our Facebook, our websites, and you can also go to that fightingcancertogether.ca site where you can find updates and more information, um, informational videos like the one that we shared at the beginning of, of the meeting. And I think also, hopefully, in the fall, we will look to have an in-person session in the communities to continue to sort of share information about the partnership. Um, hold on, wait, someone is messaging me. We also have to have a draw. So we're going to have a draw. <laughs> I didn't know. We're going to have a draw before we close the meeting. Um, so maybe uh, I could ask in the background that April 
or whomever is doing the draw could do the draw and I would like to pass it over to all the panelists to give any closing or final remarks um, at this time. So maybe we can start um, with Chief Anaquat. Would you like to just give some closing remarks for the session? I'm just uh, thankful that uh, you organized this uh, panel today. Um, messaging out to the community is really important around this good initiative. Um, community uh, buy-in is really important uh, and I feel that uh, I think we're getting there and I'm very appreciative for the hard work that the uh, Environment Office has done to put this together today. Thank you Erpo, thank you Kathleen. Um, you probably don't hear that enough but anyways uh, yes looking forward to uh, looking forward to the the partnership unfolding in this uh, in the uh, medical isotopes being delivered. Jimmy Gwetch. Jimmy Gwetch. Chief Najwan, do you have some closing remarks or a statement you'd like to share before we close? You're, you're on mute in case you don't know. I tried to fix the light around me. Now I'm on mute. The more. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, you just looked very groovy. You're kind of psychedelic over there, but you're good. Go ahead. Well, it's because it's International Water Day. <laughs> the, uh, the fact is, the more information I hear about this initiative, the more, the more I'm positive that this is a step in the right direction. And I become more assured that our participation is uh, warranted and uh, will show itself to be a very good decision going forward. What, Chief? Um, James? I'll just uh, thank you and the team for, for organizing this. Uh, appreciate the community's interest. Look forward to that in-person session. And also want to shout out to Dr. Rebecca Wong, uh, who always volunteers her time to, to help with these sessions. She's got a, a very busy practice and, and work. And, um, but, I, but I do find, uh, Dr. Wong, it's great for people to hear from a, a leader in this field like yourself. So thank you for joining us. Um, Mike, do you have any closing sort of remarks, statement, anything you'd like to say? Yeah, thanks, Kathleen. Uh, first, thank you again for inviting us into the community to talk about medical isotopes. Uh, thank you for putting this on. And another fantastic job by you and the team uh, to, to put forward a virtual session that is pretty much flawless. And uh, Dr. Wong, again, it's always so interesting to hear you speak. Uh, I just can't tell you how much we appreciate the work that, that you do day in and day out in saving lives. Uh, it really gives us a connection here in the communities uh, to, to the good that can be done with what we do every day. And, uh, you know, to be some small piece of that, I think, you know, we're very proud to be able to be able to do that. And uh, again, I just want to thank you for the continued partnership in this. And we look forward to a really bright future. Yeah, I also extend that miigwech Dr. Wong for participating today and I hope that someday we can uh, steal you away and bring you to the community and you can have some chance to uh, chat with community members who I'm sure would love to pick your brain about all sorts of different topics related related to this so that would be that would be great. So um, miigwech to all the panelists and all the attendees and before we go, I believe um, somebody is gonna spin a prize wheel and some lucky participant is going to win uh, a barbecue, a barbecue, a barbecue pack of some kind. All right, Mr. Nashua, you have won a barbecue pack. I believe it comes with a barbecue 
barbecue mints. I don't know. It's a barbecue pack anyway, so you can enjoy the nice weather and barbecue. So um, are the, we'll get... are the, Kathleen, are the panelists invited to the barbecue? Is that part of the deal? I don't know. You'll have to ask Mr. Nashqua. Well, <laughs> if deal, you're I thought, steaks and fish. Yeah, exactly. I agree with you, James. I was going to say, uh, Dwayne, if you don't have any issues with your barbecue, we can find something to do with it. <laughs> very much. Uh, he he said, uh, if you guys saw, he said, Nishin, you will have the barbecue at our place in Saugeen. There you go. <laughs> wow, I, do great, I do great steaks. If you invite me, I'll bring the steaks. Oh. All right. It's um, like we're gearing up for a party now. Uh, you got James buying too. That's good. <laughs> I said I'd bring them, not buy them. <laughs> well, on that note, what a, that's a, a good way to end the session. So let's say Bama P, Guab Min. Everyone have a enjoy the beautiful day. Be wet again. Take care, everybody. Bye. Be wet. Be wet.